Okay, so we've been on this topic of bridge building. Making peace. And we've talked about the concept of forgiveness, that it all starts with forgiveness, right? That without forgiveness, you'll never mend those broken bridges. You'll never make peace between you and others. And we talked about once we do that, part of that is having to reach out our hand to physically helping somebody. It's not just about praying for somebody and saying, I forgive you. It's like physically going and giving them a hand, maybe giving them a hug, embracing them, joining them in life, so to speak. And in concept of that, we talked last week about he's throwing a party. Doing life with people. It's not just like, oh, okay, you're forgiven, go your way. Let's resume a relationship together. Let's see what we can do together. Let's strengthen this relationship. Well, today we want to conclude this series with breaking barriers. It's a confusing one for me. Because I'm trying to figure out which barriers we're breaking. There's so many different barriers. How many of you see barriers in life? We've got political ones in our country right now, right? Who's right? Who's wrong? How do we get people together? We see it in spiritual lives. We know that the greatest relationship that can be restored is man with God. But yet, as we know when we go out there, that there's a lot of sin in this world. And getting that together... And then, believe it or not, there's barriers within the church. How many, of you, how many of you really get along with everybody else here? Hopefully we do, on the small church aside. Where it gets magnified is compare us to some other denomination who interprets the Bible slightly different than we do. We were talking about this earlier this week, even in, in the ministerium. You know, the, trying to get churches to work together. There's a certain amount of churches that will work together when we realize we have slight differences in our worship styles and interpretations on certain things. But we all believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that God created us. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He came to die so we can be forgiven of our sins. So there's, all, there's things that we can have in common. Breaking those barriers is those things that divide us. And how do we do it? So we are going to visit some Ephesians today. Let's start out with, with reading the verse together. If, if those who can, if you want to stand with me, let's read this uh, first passage. This mystery is that though the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your redemption, your love. We thank you that you care so much for us. So we ask now, Lord, that you would draw us in. Allow, quiet our souls. Allow us to hear your voice. Uh, speak to us. Guide us. And show us how we can be better at breaking these barriers. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. I think I'm going to be seated today, too. A little relief on the legs. And when you're sitting struggling with some of this stuff yourself... Maybe we just need to sit and talk. I was thinking about this before I stepped up here this morning as we're cutting into this breaking barriers. Where do you think the toughest barrier we have to break is? Possibly within ourselves. What barriers do we put up between us and God or us and other people? So we're going to go and spend time in Ephesians today as we see an example of this on this Breaking Barriers. Ephesians is a letter from Paul to the church at Ephesus. And the letter is first sent to Ephesus, but it's believed to be written to circulate between all the churches in Asia Minor. And Ephesus, of course, is the capital of the Roman province of Asia, Asia Minor, in other words, modern-day Turkey. So that's the region of the country we're dealing with. And these were people outside of Israel, right? So they'd be referred to as Gentiles. Why did Paul do this in a letter format? He couldn't be with them. He wrote this when he was in prison in Rome. So he, he wrote a lot of his epistles, his letters, from in prison. But he cared so much about the people, he was locked up, he couldn't get to them, so he would put it in writing, what he had to tell them as he continued to preach them and lead them. 
So the first three chapters of the Ephesians establishes the fact that Jesus has broken all the barriers. He establishes the fact that all who believe are seated with Christ. And establishes the true identity of who Christians are. So let's take a look in the second chapter as Paul explains this. Starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that done in the body of the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Okay, keep in mind here, once again, we said these are Gentiles, so Paul is writing to the Gentile believers. But you've got to realize at this particular time, they were the outcast. They were the sinners. They were the worthless people, at least according to the Jews. You see, there was this barrier, the division between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul is saying, okay, remember, that's who you were. How many of you felt out like outcasts at one point in your life from the church? Because of sin. Maybe you still feel that way sometimes. Am I really worthy to be here? So he, he's addressing these people and he's saying, this is where you were. So then he goes on to say, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He's saying, you've received reconciliation through Christ's sacrifice. Have we not also received that same thing? Because of Christ's sacrifice, we can be reunited through Christ with God the Father. And God created us to have a relationship with Him. Wouldn't it be neat if we were back in the garden, if things hadn't been messed up and we could walk with Him during the day? God would come to walk with Adam and Eve during the garden? What was wrong with them messing it up for us, huh? <laughs> we can't change that, can we, huh? I guess we have to forgive them, right? We talk about forgiveness, right? If we can't change it, we forgive. If we can change it, then maybe we need to. All right. So go on here. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in his, this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Basically, what's he telling us? He says, okay, you were outcast. You were put out. I understand that. But Christ came. He's destroyed that barrier. You no longer have to feel worthless. You no longer have to feel like you're unwanted because he changed everything for us. He's provided the means to, an, uh, to end all hostility. Well, he provided the means that it always happened. He provides the means for us today. Do we always take advantage of it? No, I don't think so. Christ has established a new covenant. See, the old covenant was based on laws and regulations. And these laws and regulations got so strict that Jews were the only ones worthy and you had to follow all these customs and rituals that they had established over the year. And suddenly, Jesus came and said, uh, they're God's children too. The truth is, it was referenced in the Old Testament. They were always told that God was here for more than just the Jews. But somewhere had gotten twisted around and never acknowledged that. So these were all sinful outcasts, people to be destroyed and shunned and stay away from. And, and there were some times that they had to because the evil was so evil in some of the Gentile cities. But they never figured out how to put it back together and realize God created all of them. So basically, he, based, he started a new covenant. He did away with all these laws and regulations. Now, it doesn't mean that some of those regulations and laws don't still have meaning and that we shouldn't pay attention to them. But he says, if it's not based on love, you have problems. We have to base everything on love. We have to care for one another. And this new covenant was more about love. It's like, not only what do we do, but why are we doing it? And, and are you really going to require this of all people? There was a section in the scripture, there was a time when the leaders, when um, Gentiles were coming in, 
Jews said, well, if they're going to become like us, they have to do everything. They have to be circumcised and follow all of our rituals and everything else. At least customs were totally foreign to these people. They had no idea what this meant. And they had to get together and say, hold on a minute. We've been doing this. This has been our signs of obedience. But is that really what's required? Let's get back to the essentials. Yes, they need to be accept Christ. They need to be baptized. And they need to worship Him. But do they have to do everything that the Jews did? And they had to come to an agreement. This is called breaking barriers. All those regulations were creating barriers. So they had to break it down. So, but the scripture tells us when we allow barriers to be broken down, we will find true peace. How many of you like when you don't have conflict between you and another? It's a lot more peaceful, isn't it? We find real recon reconciliation and unity with others and with the Father. And that's what we're supposed to be seeking. A unity and a reconciliation with anybody we have problems with. We're supposed to be connected with the Father and connected with each other. Each other doesn't just mean us in the church. It means each and every individual we encounter along the way. I know, some of them are unlovable, but we're supposed to. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. When we allow Christ to become the center of our life, we are no longer outcasts. If you ever felt like an outcast, if you've accepted God, you're not an outcast. You're part of the family. So if you're still hanging on to those former things you did, forgive yourself. God's already forgiven you. You are worthy. We are important, and we are children of God. And you need to remember that. If you haven't accepted him as Savior, you need to be thinking about that because maybe you're still, you're an outcast then maybe because you've chosen to stay that way. You don't have to. We can live in victory. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. See, Christ is the glue that holds us all together despite our differences. Do we agree every, with everybody in this room? How about people you work with? Do you agree with them all? Can we still work together? It's by having respect for other people. When we respect other people, we can live together. And in the Christian world, we know it's Christ who brings us all together. My favorite color is blue. Who else likes blue? Only a couple. Well, what's your favorite color? Pink? Okay, now, now you're going to admit to blue. I bet you there's a bunch of other colors in here that people like. Just because we have a difference in what colors we like, is that worth us uh, fighting over it? Or having disagreements? You know, that same principle to allows us to realize that would be petty and foolish to fight over what the best color is. Churches have done that. You know, what color carpet are we going to put in our church? Well, that's kind of stupid. Okay, let's find a way to cut, reach a common ground. But the same principle applies to bigger issues. Sit and work them out. Don't sit and fight amongst yourselves. That's how you break barriers. You can either make that bar break that barrier down or you can make it worse. So, let's review briefly what it says in here. Take a look at who we were and who we can be according to these scriptures. Now, all our old positions are going to come out of Ephesians 2.12 in this one verse. Where we were, you can consider this before Christ. These were the before Christ. And then we're going to go over the old positions, which will have various scriptures on that actually talk about these things. And that's after Christ came. This is what Christ did to us to break a barrier. Isn't he wonderful? Okay, first off, we were without Christ. It says right there, separate from Christ. We were separate from Christ in the beginning until we knew him. That was our old position. We were aliens. We were excluded from citizenship. Now he's talking to the Gentiles and he says, you're not even allowed in. This is for Jews only. 
We don't do that anymore, do we? Oh, hold on. We're the good people. We're in church, right? We're the Christians. We're not like those sinners out in the street, right? Are we giving them the same treatment the Jews were giving the Gentiles? How many of you have thought somebody who thought was unreachable? Their sins are so great. Is there any sin that can't be forgiven? We were talking about that recently in one of our last two weeks in Bible study, I believe. Is one sin worse than another? We rate sins in our human mind. God doesn't. Sin is sin. We were strangers. Foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You're just totally foreign. It's like living in a different culture. You ever go somewhere to a different part of the country or a different land where you felt so out of place you were a stranger because they did things completely different? I'll tell you that sometimes you don't have to go very far. You can move to a different part of the state sometimes and find out these people are strange. And they think you're strange. Yeah, you can be strangers real easy. And no hope. It says right there, without hope. If you think you're excluded and there's no chance for you making a reconciliation, what, what's your hope in? It's a de desperate feeling when you have no hope. And without God, it says it right there, they were without God. They weren't being allowed to even come near to God. That's an awful position to be in. But Jesus came and he changed everything. So after Jesus, we had new positions. We are now in Christ. We find that in Ephesians 2.13. And then we find a holy nation. In 1 Peter we find, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Israel used to think they were the holy nation. But you know, this nation he's talking to, I don't think is about a physical, geographical nation on this earth. This is the nation of God. This has no boundaries. It has no limits. We're talking every single person on this earth has the opportunity to be part of the holy nation. And that includes you. And no more strangers. No longer foreigners and aliens. You know, as Christians, we should be able to get along with everybody. And called it to one hope. What's our hope? That Christ will return and we will spend eternity with Him, right? We have a hope. We have something to look forward to. You know, it's got to be an awful dull life if you think there's no future. But that hope is available to everybody. And that we're with God. In Ephesians 1, 3, he said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he's saying here with God? Who is he speaking to? Once again, he's speaking to the Christians at Ephesus. He's speaking to the Gentiles, those who were told they had no God. And he's saying, the God and Father of our Lord. He's ours. He's here for everybody. So basically, Christ became a bridge to break down barriers. He was that bridge builder to where we can close that gap. We were separated from God. We were separated from each other. And he came along and says, I will pay the price so that you can be reunited with the Father. And in the same token, I want you to be reunited with each other. See, you are now in Christ because he came. Because he came to be that bridge. And now we can have unity and diversity in Christ. What does this unity and diversity mean? It does not mean we're all the same. It means we have different likes, we have different interpretations, we have different opinions, but we can still work in unity when we realize that we were, this is not an accident we believe differently. We were created with different gifts, different opinions, and we're supposed to come together and talk about them. What would happen if our politicians finally would sit down at the table and respect each other and literally work out, you know what, these different ideas they have that they're fighting over? They had them because they have different personalities. They have different perspectives. You need to sit down and share perspectives. You can do that with somebody you're not getting along with at work or anywhere else or a neighbor. 
Get to know them, know their perspective. Why do they think the way they do? And suddenly you thought they were so terrible and you realize, well, I didn't realize that's what they had happened in their life. Or I never looked at that issue in that way. And when we learn to respect the differences in people, then we can have unity. And that's what God wants within the church. It's tough when you have a barrier and you're not willing to break it. When I read, I read a story briefly the other day. I don't know if I can remember this exactly right, how it went. Apparently it happened back in the time of uh, when Hitler ran rampant. And Hitler decided to try and unite churches, obviously, to do things his way. And about half the churches joined in on it. And half didn't. Well, when Hitler's time was over, if I understand it correctly, there was a rift between these churches. Because half had joined Hitler and half hadn't. And they all knew it was wrong. They still all believed in Christ. And they said, how do we do this? And they finally came together. And what did they do? They just started talking to each other and focusing what they had in common. They all believed in Christ. And suddenly they became one. And those divisions broke down. Sometimes we have to be willing to take the step in the middle and meet people. Breaking barriers requires acceptance of the forgiveness you have been given. Have you accepted that you, you've been forgiven of your sins? Willingness to give unconditional acceptance to others. Are you willing to do that? Sure, I've forgiven people, right? Do you know what forgiveness is? Is there any sin so great that you couldn't forgive? Think about it. That could be a barrier for you. Is there any sin so great you can't forgive it? What if someone murdered one of your family members? Could you forgive them? Whoa. Now we're talking hardcore, hardcore stuff, right? Someone actually kills a family member or does serious harm to one of your family members, can you forgive them? I would wrestle with this, I think. The Christian in me would say, yes, I need to forgive. The Marine would want to take reconciliation uh, or, or revenge or get seek justice. But if I'm here to God, I think there's a time, you know, I'm not a pacifist totally. I think there's a time to fight, but I think there's a time to forgive. If somebody actually killed a member of your family, as hard it would be, the truth is you can't bring them back. Now, you want to come and harm a family member of mine, and I'm in a position to stop you, you're going to find the Marine there. I'll, I'll defend my family. But if it comes to that tragic day where it's too late, if you don't forgive, it could tear you apart. But how many can actually do that? I read another story. I don't know if I can tell this right. Anybody ever hear of Billy Neal Moore? Yeah, first time I ever heard the story. Billy was born and raised in Georgia. He obviously had a troubled life himself. And his father was in prison. So, hey, if we don't change things in our lives, things repeat themselves. We need to set patterns straight so that history doesn't keep repeating itself. But his father was in prison, so he ended up having to be the man of the house. Well, as he gets to be an older teenager, his dad gets out of prison and they butt heads because you can't have two men of the house. Two alpha males fighting. Billy's been doing it, but his dad says, I'm back. I'm taking, resuming my position of head of his household. So Billy said, I got to get out of here. Well, Bill, Billy gets married, has a child of his own, and he joins the army and he goes off into the army. Except Billy is not doing too well. Billy is having trouble keeping up on the bills. He can't make ends meet. He 
I'm hearing these stories about this guy supposedly in the community says, you wouldn't believe this. This guy keeps all kinds of money on him. He keeps it in his house. He doesn't put it in a bank. So one night as Billy is kind of high on, I understand his combination of smoking marijuana and drinking some hard alcohol. He's not thinking too clearly, I don't think. And he figures he needs money, and he decides he's going to break in and see if this story is true. He's going to get some money. And he goes and breaks into this old man's house. He gets an interesting greeting. He gets greeted by a shotgun blast. Obviously, the old man sh should have taken better aim, maybe, but he didn't. But Billy had brought a gun with him himself. His, what's his instant reaction? He drew and fired back and killed the old guy. In a panic, he gathers up the guns and he, got, he managed to get his hands on two wallets and he scampers out of there and he flees. And he gets back, he found out the stories were true about this guy keeping all this money on him because between these two wallets, he found he had $5,000. Now, most petty thieves at $5,000 would probably be rejoicing. <laughs> I made the score. Not Billy. You see, the minute he had shot the old man, he was hit with remorse. He knew that he had done something wrong. He had taken a life. So rather than rejoicing over his score, he was remorseful, and he knew that the authorities were going to be coming for him. So he called a family member to go and take care of his son, knowing that he was going to get arrested. And sure enough, he gets locked up and convicted and sentenced to death. Billy spends, from my understanding, 16 years on death row. As all the appeals went through and everything else, People were making fun at him, of him. Yeah, yeah, dead man walking, I'm sure they were calling him, and all that kind of thing. And there were some people that tried to... He was truly remorseful. He knew he had done wrong. And there were people who tried to tell him about Christ's forgiveness, but it wasn't sinking in. Until one day a pastor came in and befriended him, and he accepted Christ. He started studying, eventually got his degree and got ordained as a minister. Now, I may not have the time sequence on all this when these things happen, but in all of this, he became ordained. He started preaching in the church, but he also still felt so sorry about this family. He managed to get a hold of an address of one of the family members of the man he had shot says, I need forgiveness. He writes a letter to this family member. What would your reaction be getting a letter like that? <laughs> Probably not too receptive, but instead he got a response back saying, yes, our whole family is Christians and we forgive you. He was forgiven by the family of the very people. And if you think that isn't enough, they continue to write letters, build a friendship. From what I understand, if I understand right, even when Billy's family would come in to visit, they would help take care of his family. Put them up and take care of them. After 16 years on death row, that sentence was eventually changed to a life sentence. And part of it was not only the evidence of his changed life, but the family of the man he killed also wrote letters to the parole boards asking them to offer him forgiveness. I was commuted to life sentence from what I understand he did get out of jail and he now still goes back into prisons. He goes other places and he preaches and he preaches about the love of God and he preaches about forgiveness. He was a life that was truly changed. Would you be willing to forgive someone who killed somebody in your family if you knew that God would work through in that way? 
a problem is when the problem when we come up to that point of having to ask or give that forgiveness we can't see the end result we just have to swallow our hurt and realize that it's the proper thing to do because that's what Christ did for us so what barriers in your life can you not break down because you are holding a grudge because you say that is a step too far. But if this family, I wonder, since he was remorseful, even though he had accepted Christ, I wonder what strength Billy would have had to continue along the lines he was doing if the family would have rejected him when he asked for forgiveness. You could severely hurt somebody that way. When all God wants to do is offer forgiveness, offer love, offer a better way. So what barriers do we have to break? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the forgiveness you gave us. We weren't worthy of the forgiveness you gave us. We've committed many sins. We did many wrongs. But when we came back to you, you said... <laughs> I have forgotten it already. You're mine, and I love you. Lord, thank you for that forgiveness, and also give us that same love, that same will, same power to be able to forgive anybody, regardless of what the sin is. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.